You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we've got a fab fact that's out of this world. We are having problems striking oil in the randomizer. And it's Christmas in July with an exclusive preview of a TV21 audio annual. Oh, not Joe 90. Anyway, that's all coming up in uh, Pod 215. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Okay, when I say I'm, I don't want Joe 90, I'm serious. Yeah. You are, really, right? I can tell. Yeah. I don't what? want what? Joe whoa, 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 I'm joking. Whoa, whoa. Uh, it's actually, it's totally up to producer Ben uh, what happens in the feature. So if he wants yeah. to put Joe 90 yeah. in, yeah. that's what's yeah. going to happen. You're going to have to deal with it. Anyway, um, it's hmm. not all about me complaining about Joe 90 here, but it is mostly uh, well, here at the Jerry Anderson mostly. Podcast. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jamie Lionel Anderson. Uh, and I am the younger son of Jerry Anderson, MBE. I'm joined here today by this other fine gentleman known as Richard James. Richard, would you like to say more about yourself? Uh, six foot one, uh, fairly slim, dark hair, slightly bent this, nose, big chin. This, this isn't what? a dating profile, Richard oh, well, James. Sorry, this I'm, is the I'm on the wrong podcast, podcast. Aren't I? I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. Well, mm. well uh, I am Richard James, uh, co-host of the Jerry Anderson podcast, and uh, I'm going to say star of Jerry Anderson's Space Precinct. Uh, I agree. Put that in your pipe. If anyone on Ted that Chappell thing was a star, yeah, whoever he is, <laughs> never heard of him. Uh, well, there you go. It's nice to, yeah. nice to have you here. Uh, well, now, thanks. Over there in the yes. corner, we're also joined by Chris <gasps> the Randomizer Dale. There he is. Who today, Yeah. I mean, what? I've not seen him do quite what? this sort of thing before, no. but he... He's he's got a giant blackboard oh, in front of him, yeah, and he's scrolling with all sorts of colours of chalk. What appears to be a concept for a canine reboot of yes. Thunderbirds. That's what he's doing. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, I'd, I'd go for that. I mean, they they look pretty cool in their uniforms, and even in the yeah. hats, there's room for the ears out the sides. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think I'm not it could really work. sure it's going to fly. That no, I, I don't well, know. I mean, it's. Thunderbirds I mean, meets Paw Patrol, really, isn't it? They've, which, they've had to tuck their tails into their trousers, which looks a bit odd. Yeah, maybe make some room for those. Anyway, mm. when Chris has finished designing his new concept for Thunder Dogs, which I'm assuming yes. is the title, he's nodding yeah. it is, uh, Great. then he'll be here with the randomizer where he presses the big red button on his randomizer, which randomly selects a random episode of a random Jerry Anson series, and he says some things about it which are not random at all. They're very smart and funny, in fact. So it goes to show that Chris can be smart and funny uh, as opposed Sometimes to when he's months. doing this weird yeah. dog thing yeah but anyway what go on what else is coming well, anything can, can i just say thunder dogs does sound brilliant doesn't it, it i mean it's the it's the canine equivalent of thunder cats isn't it really yes. or or is it more like international rescue with with yeah. dogs canine international now, rescue i know we've got a lot of uh, very talented artists out there some of whom are members of our facebook group so i would love to see your renditions <laughs> of the Thunder Dogs in full yes. Thunderbirds uh, uniforms, please. Uh, breeds of your choosing. Uh, let's see your pictures. Put them up on our Facebook group. Yeah, I've so okay. Related to this, then, mm. and and I also, if you're the first time here, you're a Podstron, so I'm referring to oh, you yeah. as Podstron. So yeah. if you're a first time here at Podstron, oh, we don't normally go down this route, but you know, mm. Chris Dale has opened a can of worms or dogs here. Uh, mm. So if you had to, what Tracy brother would be what breed? Oh, so, yeah. would you, for example, think, well, Virgil's obviously a German Shepherd. Oh, um, really? Perhaps you'd think of Gordon as a Manchester Terrier. I don't know, but I'd love right. to know, along with those sketches, yeah. what breed do you think each Tracy brother would be and why? Okay. How's that? 
Okay. Uh, right. So aside uh, aside from that, uh, well, let's have a look at what else we've got coming up uh, in this week's podcast. Uh, before we get to the randomizer, of course, we've got fab facts coming up in just a little moment. We've got some news from the Jerry Anderson universe because there's always something new happening somewhere. We've got a rather special feature this week, which is a little uh, uh, excerpt, should I say, or a trailer for the yeah. uh, TV Twenty One Audio Annual coming up a little later on and in and amongst all that uh, we've got some uh, twitterings and witterings from our lovely podstrons who've been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.com they've been posting on our facebook group hashtagging us on twitter and uh, commenting on our youtube channel i shall be reading out as many of those as i can marvelous yeah i look forward to all those twitty plops coming up uh, in Absolutely. due course that's the unmanese for twitter tweets very good. isn't it very good yeah like probably it. Anyway, uh, I would like to strike out in a new direction right? Uh, and um, yes? do a fab fact. <laughs> oh, why do you it's do not, that? It's not new at all, is it? But anyway, no, it's, it's fab facts. <sighs> now, time for this week's fab facts. Fab facts. Yes. Richard James, mm. most favouritest part of the podcast. Yeah, get on with it. Book of Fab Facts, Richard shouts fab when I flick through it, there's a fab fact and I'll read it. Is that all right? (laughs) Perfectly put. Very succinct in a nutshell. Brilliant. Right, well, here comes the rest of the nutshell. Off we go. Fab! Hmm? What? Well, yeah? How'd I do? We're in the mid-60s zone again. Okay, I I mean, it's it's a big area mid-60s, so there's no reason why not. So, Mm -hmm. here's a question... Were there aliens in Thunderbirds? Well, Uh I had a a load of no's there. Yes. And a few yeses. So, well, one might be tempted to shout no or just say it. If you did shout no and you're on the train or something and people are giving you a weird look, that's not my fault. Uh, No. But, obviously, then you'd be forgetting about the rock snakes in Thunderbirds are go. Right. Yes, of course. So clearly an alien influence there. Yeah. However... The comics and novels were a little bit looser in their approach to the question of extraterrestrial life than the TV uh, episodes or the films were. International Rescue encountered all sorts of interplanetary menaces uh, in the books of John Thaden and the TV Century 21 stories written by Alan Fennell. Mm -hmm. One or two of these monsters appeared on the cover of the comic, TV Century 21, uh, but not as an illustration by Frank Bellamy, who was the, the artist. Several issues... Those featuring the Thunderbirds story Solar Danger in issues 83 to 90 yeah. featured two monsters believed to have been sculpted by AP Films technician Roger Dickin mm-hmm. and captured by legendary set photographer Doug Luke, who we've talked about oh, before. Yes. Yeah. Because they were featured in photographs, some readers thought these two monsters, which are kind of scaly reptiles, in fact, I've got one on my shelf behind me up right there. There it is. You see yeah. it over there? Yeah. yeah um, they thought those scaly monsters were going to be featured in the series. But the truth is, they were probably sculpted and posed exclusively for those publicity snapshots for the front page of TV21. Mm-hmm. One monster who also turned up on a bubblegum card looks like the dragon or Loch Ness monster sort of hybrid thing. It's the blue one, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, While the other is a very weird alien bug monster with tentacles, which uh, it used to grab hold of Thunderbird 1. So they're quite dramatic Mm. images. Very cool. Absolutely, yeah. Now, if it is true that Roger Dickens sculpted these creatures, then it means that they are both part of a xenomorphic family tree. Right. Roger was, of course, heavily involved in the making of Alien in 1979, oh. and he built and puppeteered the famous chestburster <gasps> creature. Lovely. So there's some shared DNA right there between mm. Thunderbirds and Alien, but you weren't expecting that. Yeah. Uh, so how do you feel about aliens or other creatures in the normally rather down-to-earth Thunderbirds? Do write in and let us know, podcast at jerryanderson.com. Um, mm. I mean, they do appear from time to time. And obviously, if you go down the route of Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet, at the very least being in the same universe, then obviously the Mistrons kind of can yeah. come into Thunderbirds. And if yeah. you go even further into Stingray, then you've got the undersea aliens. And of course, Lady Penelope and Parker appear in a Fireball XL5 strip with uh-huh. the Astrons, I think. So right. if you connect all those things, there's no reason, well. according to the comics and the books, 
while the, while the world of Thunderbird shouldn't be filled with aliens. Yes. How interesting. For me, it doesn't sit that comfortably. It's odd, isn't it? It's a bit no, like when they do a sort of a, I don't know, a time travel. Well, uh, the new Indiana Jones thing is apparently is it, well, the film is featuring ghosts and time travel. Mm. You think, well, that's, no, no, that's wrong. That's not the same universe. And it feels the same with Thunderbirds and aliens. They don't sit well together. Strange, it's isn't it? Yeah, it's that, funny. That, that something set in its own world mm, should yeah. have rules so strict that yeah, aliens appearing right. are problematic. Yes, yes, odd. Yeah. So, yeah, me. well, what do you think, Postron? Still, let us know. Should aliens be allowed in the world of Thunderbirds or is it strictly terrestrial? Um, mm. We would love to know your thoughts. Email us mm. podcast at jerryanderson.com or uh, why not tweet us? Hashtag Jerry yeah. Anderson Podcast. Tag me, yeah. I'm Jamie Anderson. Mm. Him, Richard N. James, or him over there. Yeah. Still drawing his Thunderdogs. It's Chris Dalek. Um, Yeah, if you say so. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this week's Alien Alien Fact. Fact. Yes, there we go. Of course it was. It couldn't be anything else, could it? No, no, no. It's very good. I like that. Uh, Now, you can, as Jamie has just mentioned, get in touch with us at podcast at jerryanderson.com, as many of you have been doing over the past few days. Uh, So this is from Ambassador Paul Hyde from the Isle of Wight, who says, Hi, chaps. How's it all going? I have an idea for some merchy merch, merch, merch. Remember when you did the UFO using the cigarette cards with pictures on both sides? Well, I noticed while looking on the Facebook Podders page that someone had a Joe 91, and I was wondering if if you could create one i'd buy it in a flash if you did now jamie don't refuse it i know you don't like joe 90 but give it a go please and that's from ambassador paul hyde what are the chances jamie i would never well, ban I, the I involvement of face. joe 90 i mean I, that's just my face richard but as, yeah. as you i mean the tv 21 audio annual includes a joe 90 story so mm. and i could have vetoed mm. that but i did not mm. veto. Mm. no of course not of course not. No, nor would i um no. posters and stuff Maybe, maybe we've got to get mm. the source material and all that kind of thing. So mm. it's it's a possibility, but I definitely can't make a single promise, let alone no. 90 of them. Sorry. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Chris Hosey. I'm a big fan of Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, 1960s and 2005 versions, Stingray and Joe 90. I just wanted to say that I love the podcast. It's very exciting, entertaining and at times hilarious. Oh, only at times, though. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty uh, rare. It's true. Also, I wanted to say that I'm a big fan of Sonic X, an anime show which has elements that are inspired by Thunderbirds, in particular the folding palm trees before Tails launches his plane, the X Tornado. As a side note, how would you guys feel about a Sonic X or Sonic show of any kind that was heavily based or themed on Thunderbirds? And if it came to pass, would it be an Anderson Entertainment series? Oh, that's quite oh. a crossover suggestion. I yes. think we, we're some way from that sort of thing uh, yes. happening. I mean, you, again, you never know, but it's a bit of an odd one, especially if we're already in Fab Fact saying that uh, aliens in Thunderbirds. Oh, that's, that's a bit weird. Yeah, fair enough. Sonic yeah. the Hedgehog? I mean... <laughs> Hmm. Okay. Uh, Jeff Webb says, Hi all. Richard was talking about whether Stanley Unwin scripted his Unwinese or made it up off the cuff. Yes, oh, this yes. is in response to that clip we had of Stanley Unwin and Peter Hawkins, uh, who was the voice of uh, Bill and Ben. I've been a lifelong fan of the great man, says Jeff, and I love trying to burble along with the style of the dialect talking, uh, but I'm fairly rubbish at it. A few years ago, I managed to get hold of a copy of his autobiography, Deep Joy, Master of the Spoken Word. I hoped that this would unlock the secret of this strange form of English, but he tells the reader very little of how he constructed it. From the few hints he drops, I suspect much of the rambolodes were scripted, but he kept some stock phrases ready to go to use on people. No matter how he managed it, he was certainly a very talented man. Uh, The comedian Jim Davidson used to speak on Winnie's on his Saturday night TV shows on a regular basis, along with having Stanley as a guest, so he may know the secret. Best wishy folds, Jeff Webb. Mm. Wishy folds. Yes, yeah, nice, isn't it? Well, perhaps Lovely. we should try and get Jim Davidson on the podcast. No, no, maybe not. Uh, Ian Plowman says, uh, Hi, chaps, I'm very interested in your card game Danger Zone, and I would like to suggest that you put up a sample game being played to drum up interest as a demonstration as how to play. Just an idea, regards Ian. Well, Ian, that's a great mm. idea. Isn't it? But I hate to say it, we've, we're <gasps> one step ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, as you will have seen a couple of weeks ago, we put out the video with Andrew Harmon explaining about how the game was developed. Uh, and we will be doing some playthroughs online in due course. What I'd really like to do is hmm. get the cast of the audio Thunderbirds oh, wow. to play the game. Yes. 
Wouldn't that character. be fun? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, the, the person who takes on the Jeff role changes each round. So uh, sure. obviously when it comes around to John Colshaw, he's going to be uh, doing doing a, his special Jeff turn. Yeah. I'd love to hear, you know, Genevieve Gaunt's uh, Jeff, though. I mean, that'd be pretty fun. <laughs> but yeah, yes. we'll be putting those out. And um, also, if there's a group of you that would like to volunteer to get together and play a game and would up, be up filming it, we'd love to hear from you as well. So um, yeah. drop, nice. drop us a note podcast at jerryanderson.com obviously you have to be in the same place um to do that because otherwise the uh the shared physical card element won't work um sure. but um yeah that would be very cool actually i'd love love to see some genuine podsterons or ander fans playing that game so drop us yeah. a note great and uh, finally from the email bag uh, Roger Dodge Morgan says howdy partners in pod 213 you talked about Ed Bishop using his Straker persona uh, or rather basing his Straker persona on a report about the US nuclear deterrent and the two personnel in charge of launching the missiles having guns to shoot each other if they went mad well apart from the whole scenario being mad this rang a bell I'm sure I saw this on an episode of Wicker's World way back when in the late 60s and the reason I remember this is I thought at the time there needed to be two keys turned simultaneously to launch the ICBMs and they were too far apart for one person to do it so if you killed your colleague you wouldn't be able to launch yeah. Mm. Roger says it's a mutually assured destruction world or it was back then P-W-O-R-F-A-B-N-S-I-G from Roger Morgan yeah okay Wicker's world yes I remember that could be now, uh, our investigations continue with the uh, yeah. lovely team at Network with their archive. Mm-hmm. Um, now, they've done most of Wicker's World, and they don't think it is a Wicker's World episode. Okay, fair I enough. Think, I think as per last week, maybe it might be a World in Action or similar. Yeah. Although the World in Action one, they think it could be, is from 1961. So it's a long time before, or is it 63? Anyway, it's a long time before, uh, and they think it was only transmitted once. It's the mystery... Of yep. archive telly, but we yeah. intend to solve it because I kind of want to see this interview and see how much of that, that the guy mm. talking about it gets into uh, Ed's performance as Straker. Yes, so, yeah. If maybe we do he find even it. wore a blonde wig. Yeah, maybe he did, yes. Uh, and if we do find it, wouldn't it be great to play some of it on the podcast? That would be really That's interesting. That's my desire. So we mm. will keep searching. Um, so yeah. stand by for further action, Podstrons. Excellent. Uh, all for now, but if you'd like your email read out next time, do send it in to podcast at jerryanderson.com. Mm. Oh, and don't forget, oh. we're asking for your ander wrongs. Yes. What do you hate when people get wrong about the Jerry Anderson universe? Can't <laughs> so, believe that's email a thing. Them in, and in the subject line, ander wrongs, A N D E W R O N G S. Good luck. I've got one. Oh, yeah. It's when people post a photo of Jerry Anderson and it's actually the late Northern Irish broadcaster. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Uh, yeah. It does from time to time, but rarely, yeah. but uh, yeah. definitely the wrong one. Yeah, or when, anyway. people do, when you do a search for the Jerry Anderson podcast and there's another Jerry Anderson podcast not called the Jerry Anderson podcast, well, that's him, but a podcast isn't it? featuring Jerry Anderson. Yes, that's right. Yeah, Maybe yeah, you've heard yeah. of it at home, Podstrons. Maybe you know the other Jerry Anderson. Yeah. Maybe you're here by mistake because you were hoping to listen yes. to the Northern Irish Jerry Anderson. So Sorry. Sorry. We're definitely not as funny. That's all I can say. No. no. Uh, but there are two of us, so, you know, swings and roundabouts. Doubly money. Anyway, hmm. not about that broadcast, Jerry Anderson, but about the producer, Jerry Anderson. Mm-hmm. Would you like some mm-hmm. Jerry Anderson producer news? Oh, yes, please. Go on. Okay, well then, um, probably now we should have some Jerry Anderson news. It's that, Jerry Anderson. Newsy news. News, news, news. News, news. You always forgot to yes. do it, didn't you? I yeah, saw I you I'm looking just, down. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm reading ahead. Go on. What? Are you ahead to what? I mean, you haven't got anything to say. It's my bit now. Because well, I'm the one that. that does the news. I, look, right, I'm going to do the news right now, in fact. Go on, then. Go on. So let's get going with 10 days of summer. Well, it's not 10 days of summer now. It's actually uh, seven days of summer. Anyway, this is all part of our 10 days of summer sale. 10 days, 10 deals, all irresistible, obviously. Uh, If you're listening to this on the day of release, you may have missed the first three, or maybe you've seen them. Those have included Christmas jumpers and a book bundle, amongst other things. Uh, There'll be a different deal going live every single day, and you can find them at ander.sn slash 10 days. That's A-N-D-R dot S-N slash 1-O-D-A-Y-S. 
so yes enjoy those now speaking of uh, christmas jumpers in july we're also launching today our christmas jumper 2022 design competition oh i like that i know it's hot i know it's july i know it's not christmas but it will be in a few months time uh you may have seen our thunderbirds christmas jumpers from 2020 and 2021 they're gloriously ugly uh, amazing kind of eye-watering disgusting designs which i love lots of people love some hate but if you love them and you would like to be the person behind the design for our 2022 christmas jumper then now is your chance for this week only we're accepting designs for our 2022 design and uh, you could be the one that makes it to the final thing the final jumper your design it's got to be four colors only on one single color background so you might say five colors i suppose normally that background color is uh, black or uh, navy blue or something like that mm -hmm. so four colors on top of that must be thunderbirds and uh, other than that have at it enjoy if you want to try and do jeff tracy in a santa hat go for that if you want to do Thunderbird 2 as a Christmas tree with loads of other Thunderbirds hanging off of it, go for that. Those are two really bad ideas. I'm sure you can do better. Uh, send your design in to christmas at jerryanderson.com by 11.59pm this Sunday, the 31st of July. Uh, and we will judge very, very quickly and get back to you. The winner will get a £500 prize package from the Jerry Anderson store. And your design will be created. There are T's and C's uh, available via social media. And if you can't find them, then just drop us a tweet or something and we will send you the link. If you've been waiting around for the Corgi Thunderbird 2 and Thunderbird 4 to come back in stock, it's finally arrived. It's got nice new packaging. Sometimes simple's just best, isn't it? And the Thunderbird 2 toy, I mean, what could be better than that, really? Lovely. So uh, that is available now if you just go to anderdotson slash tb2. Now over to YouTube. Uh, new Captain Scarlet. Captain Scarlet's best bits. Fantastic little 10-minute uh, compilation clip reel from ac there uh, it really gets you in the kind of in the mood for a bit of new captain scarlet so uh, head over there to youtube.com slash jerry anderson tv and you can enjoy that compilation there alongside an interview that i did with shaki le uh, who is our kind of editorial lead on the ufo comic anthologies uh, he's done a fantastic job there and it was a, a, a real pleasure to have a chat with him about the history of TV action and Countdown, how the books have come together, the challenges, the best bits, and some thoughts on how closely related those trips are to the TV show too. And of course, our final screening is coming up for Jerry Anderson, A Life Uncharted at number eight Pershaw. That's in the Midlands, for those of you who don't know where Pershaw is, because I certainly didn't, I'm afraid to say. Uh -oh. um, They've also got a week long, or I think longer than that, two week long um, Anderson exhibition that's been going on uh, with oh. all sorts of tart toys and props and collectibles and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's the 23rd of July. We would love to see you there. Great. And that, uh, now, uh, yeah, no, no, wait. Oh, but just before yes. we go, Jamie, mm -hmm. I've got some news of my own. It's rather old news, but this comes courtesy well, hang of on. If it's old Leg. news. <laughs> if it's old news, why are you doing it in the news? It's oldie, old, old, old. Is that okay. what we call it? Yeah, yes, like uh, that. comes courtesy of Juliet Legg over on our Facebook group, who uh, was uh, searching through some old memorabilia of hers, and she came across this article from the Henley Standard. Now, unfortunately, the picture cuts off the date, but by the picture of your father, I would say, Jamie, that it's probably 2000 and what, eight, nine? Nine, I'd ten? say something like you that. Think? Eight, nine, yeah. 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 Nine, let's say nine. It's uh, a piece from the, uh, the Henley Standard by their reporter, Nigel Wigmore, with the fantastic headline, Flipping Awful Bins. F-A-B. I see what you did there. Yes. Oh, dear. Uh, Thunderbirds creator blasts off over new waste scheme. Listen to this. The creator of the 60s hit TV series Thunderbirds this week pledged to join a protest march against wheelie bins. Jerry Anderson volunteered to give a talk about his work to demonstrators if it encouraged more of them to join the march on Henley Town Hall. The TV and film producer said, if it helps to get people together, mobilise the troops as it were, I'm prepared to give a presentation of my work followed by a meeting of all those people living in Henley like myself who are very angry that these wheelie bins have been forced on the town. He wants to get people out of their shells and said residents who felt strongly about the issue should take action. Now, here we are. This dates it, this paragraph. Mr Anderson, 80, who lives in Nuffield, uh, claimed he was not consulted by South Oxfordshire District Council about the introduction of the wheelie bins, which residents will have to use from June the 8th. Isn't that sweet? 
the serious matters of the day. But I remember him being very cross about those wheelie yeah. bins. Obviously, yeah. So thanks thanks very much uh, to Juliet Legg for posting that and for allowing me to nick it and read it out. Thanks, Juliet Legg. Uh, well, have you got any more news from 13 years ago that you want to add on or are you done uh, now? No, not this week. I think I'm done, thanks. OK, well, maybe there's a future feature where at the end of the news we've got a, a news item from the distant past, which is completely <laughs> irrelevant. Why not? Let's add it in. Maybe, uh, yeah. Anyway... I think, now that Richard has said his piece about flipping awful bins, that's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. Annoying, wasteful collection news. <laughs> God. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he has such a beard in his bonnet it, about that. It's funny, isn't it? Anyway, oh, a lovely picture of him there with Thunderbird 2 and a, and a green bin. It's on top of the wheelie bin, yeah, classic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, over on our Facebook group, I've mentioned it already. Uh, that's where Juliet Legg posted that article. Uh, people have been uh, sharing their thoughts, comments and reviews of various things that have been coming out recently. Uh, James Munro. Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, he says, after a good few months of having to be very frugal with spending, uh, in part due to a certain weekend in Birmingham that was so worth it, I finally got some spare funds to play with so I picked up or pre-ordered deep breath ready for this list Thunderbirds vs The Hood Thunderbirds Danger Zone TV 21 Audio Annual UFO Complete Series DVDs UFO Destruct Positive CD Space Precinct Demeter City Space Precinct Revisited Space Precinct Reloaded New Captain Scarlet Operation Sabre and as you wow. may have seen in the background of some of my photos the Sonic the Hedgehog Lego set Phew. Nice. Says, what a that collection that should keep me going for a while I know what that's a dedication. collection incredible no wonder you could afford to go away for a weekend Jamie <laughs> uh Yes, not sure that's quite how it works, but okay. <laughs> but no, what a lovely now, set of stuff there. I hope you enjoy it. That's yeah, going to take you a while to get through. Yes, yeah, that's great. Uh, now, some sad news from Roger Smith, who says, I'm posting this with a heavy heart. As much as I love building my model kits, it takes up too much of my time, and I'm struggling to keep up with the everyday basics, such as cleaning and maintaining my home. So something has to give. He says, I will be rehoming my collection. Please don't ask any questions as I can't handle talking about it. But below is a list of what's available, all free of charge, but to good homes only. Serious inquiries only, please. Thanks for reading and understanding. And here's a list of the things he's giving away to make extra time. Uh, dustpan and brush, sponges, dusters, mop and bucket, window cleaner, hoover, dishwashing liquid, laundry detergent, fabric softener, laundry baskets, toilet brush, cleaning sprays and scrubbing brushes. Well done, Roger. You had us all going. Oh, I see. Yeah, I was <laughs> feeling see? very sorry for you, Roger. Roger, but not now. <laughs> I have to say, Roger does post some amazing pictures of uh, the model work that he does. Uh, really worth a look. And of course, he presented you at the uh, Birmingham Podcast, the live podcast, with a wonderful recreation of the uh, the planes dedicated to your. Uh, Exactly, your, your dad's brother, to Lionel, your, yeah, which now right. sit on the amazing writing desk, which used to lovely. belong to my grandfather, his father Joe. So it's it's Perfect. a lovely little, lovely little corner yeah. with all that stuff on. So thank you, Roger. Uh, Jed Thompson posted, I would love to see a Jerry Anderson iPhone or iPad case. I think we did iPhone cases for a while, but it yeah. um, didn't seem very popular, actually. Oh, fair enough. Uh, Age Swatterage <laughs> says, I just finished the Protector's box set. It's taken me two years, but I feel it's a kind of rite of passage to watch every Jerry Anderson episode. Do I get a medal? <laughs> Only Lavender Castle and Terror Hawks to go, he says. You will, what? You left... Terror Hawks and Lambda Goss <laughs> until after the Protectors, you masochist. <laughs> Goodness it's me. It's funny, isn't it? Uh, Podstrons, I'd love to know, are you completists? D do you feel that you, you know, have you at some point sat down and watched every Jerry Anderson episode of every Jerry Anderson series? Do you feel that's something that has to be done? Or are you happy just dipping in and out? Or do you have your own favourite series that you're keen yeah. on and you can leave the rest? I bet there are a few out there who have to watch everything. Probably, yeah. I mean, mm. I'm not one of them. I have I have not seen every episode of The Protectors. Right. I think most other things. I haven't seen every supercar. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen every Four for the Falls or definitely not Torchy. I've seen every Twizzle, yeah. but there is only one left, yeah. so that's easy. Yeah, fair uh, enough. Yes, there's, yeah. there's, plenty, there's plenty of stuff that I haven't seen all of, and I actually have no desire to see all of, strangely. No. Maybe that, is, that, yeah. is that a terrible thing? No, have I, I, have I just confessed what, to something awful? the of Jerry Anderson? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? But, I, yeah, it feels yeah. kind of an odd thing to want to do because we, look, we yeah. celebrate all the past and... And the future, mm. the present and the future. So, mm. anyway, there you go. Maybe I'm a bit more like Dad than I realised. 
Well, maybe. Uh, Lauren J. Gradwell finally says that she's melting in Manchester. Thank you, Jamie and Ben, for bringing the documentary up here to Boiling Manchester. We braved the heat outside and inside the building, and it was so worth it. A beautifully made documentary showing Jerry's life from several points of view while including clips of his creations throughout. I liked how everything that was said included backup information behind it. Very emotional at times, particularly with Lionel's story. The most moving part for me was the bridge scene. Thank you so much for making this. I now know and understand the man that was Jerry Anderson much more than I did before I saw the documentary. Thank you, says Lauren. That's brilliant, Lauren. Thank you. It was great to see you there. Uh, We should have got a picture with you, actually. You took took a picture of me and Ben, but we didn't get one with Ah, you, ridiculously. Yeah, Um, yeah, it was really hot there. Oh, my goodness me. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, Ben and I joined in for the last bit of the film and came in because obviously we've seen it quite a few times yeah yeah and i went in and sat on stage and within about five minutes i was uh Mm. yeah Mm. quite quite sweaty so yeah nice thanks for those who came and and tolerated the heat yeah it's interesting isn't it jamie i remember at the beginning of this journey you were uh sort of reassuring people who were maybe a little worried about the whole sort of warts and all aspect of the documentary Mm. and you were very keen to point out that you felt that people would know and understand jerry anderson and therefore know and understand the work of jerry anderson to a greater degree having seen it and i think that's absolutely borne out by the many reviews and the people uh, that we've received that they've been to see it yeah, I think so. I think so. You know, it was never going to be a hatchet job. That was not, not mm. the plan. It was just yeah. a kind of who is this man and why did he do what he did? And I That's right. hope we've answered that question quite well, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all for now, but do join in the fun if you are, are on Facebook. Uh, it's a growing, I think, about 854. Wouldn't it be nice to hit a thousand members by the end of this year? Could we do it? I mean, I don't see why not. There's more than a thousand, yeah. well, loads more than a thousand who listen. So yeah. if you are on yeah. Facebook and you're thinking right now, well, I'm not a member. Or pop along, yeah. it's very welcoming. Yeah, Facebook.com slash groups slash podsterons. That's P O D S T E R O N S. That's it, exactly. All for now, but more Facebook posts next week. Phew. Uh, mm. Well, Richard James, I've yes. got a treat for you. Oh, thank God. Is it a lovely piece of watermelon? <laughs> I've actually got one in my fridge. Well, half is a watermelon. Is it a gin and tonic? Or is no. it some salted caramel ice cream? No. It's oh. a break from me. Oh, well, that'll do. Yeah, that's yeah, also. You'd be happy with that. It's almost as refreshing yeah. as a piece of watermelon in the DMT. <laughs> it really is. Uh, yeah. No, so there's no guest this time. There's no interview. Mm-hmm. As you know, we've been making podfuls of full cast audio dramas and audio books, uh, yes. with more soon to be announced things that are in the can that haven't been, uh, well, haven't seen the light of day yet. Mm-hmm. But today we have a very special treat from our new release. Stand by for action. No, that's not what it's called, Ben. But you put it in there anyway. Uh-oh. Um, but today we have a very special treat from our new release. Anything Can Happen, a TV21 uh-huh. audio annual. This new CD set contains stories from classic annuals, read for you by the uber-talented Nick Briggs and the multi-super-uber-talented Wayne Forrester. Uh, we're going to share one of those stories with you today. Uh, the set includes two Stingray, two Thunderbirds, two Captain Scarlet and a Joe 90, as well as a lovely making of uh, interview with uh, me, unfortunately, but you won't hear that today, uh, Nick and Wayne uh, chatting about what annuals mean and uh, how they're a great way to expand your kind of enjoyment of all things Anderson. So there we go. Over to our audio annual, Anything Can Happen. Stand by for action. About to launch Stingray. Stingray, 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 Stingray. Marineville must go. Read by Nicholas Briggs. Demolish the Marineville Command Center? Pull down my headquarters? You must be out of your minds. The voice of Commander Shaw rose to a furious bellow that rattled every fitting and fixture in the main control room and sent the eyebrows of the two men facing him telegraphing up and down an alarm. My dear sir, quavered the man with the briefcase and the neat, precise spectacles. My dear sir, 
pray contain yourself. This is by government order, you understand. Tell him, Professor Molway, tell him again. The second of the two visitors to Commander Shaw's WASP nerve centre waved a bunch of papers in the air and spoke in a high-pitched, lecturing voice. It couldn't be simpler. Experiments and tests which I <coughs> have made prove, sir, positively prove, that relics of a forgotten civilization lie buried beneath this spot, this very spot. It is of the utmost historical importance. The professor's speech was cut short for the umpteenth time, as the purple-faced commander hammered his fist on the panel of his motorized chair. "'I don't care if you're the greatest archaeologist in the world!' he roared. "'I don't care if you bring the whole government to back you up. "'You're gonna be the one who'll make the history "'when I have you fired out of one of my rocket launch tubes. "'So out! Out!' "'Voices shaking with almost hysterical irritation, "'the two men left with a final barrage of warnings and threats.' You'll be hearing more of this, sir. More, do you hear? Two miles off the coast from Marineville, Stingray slid quietly across the ocean floor on a routine patrol. Troy sat relaxed at the controls, and Phones was humming quietly to himself as he penciled tracings and details on the navigation chart. This sure has been a quiet run, Phones. Seems like one of those rare days when nothing happens at all. But suddenly the radio burst into life, and the whole craft seemed to come alive to the irate voice of Commander Shaw. Gee, Troy, the commander's sure steamed up about something. Phones' voice was a whisper. This is Stingray to control, said Troy. Can you speak a little slower and more clearly, Commander? Your message is unreadable. Repeat, unreadable. I said, Tempest, to bring Stingray back to base at once. Now, is that clear? Sure, Commander. What's up? You sound like Marineville's under attack. It is, bellowed Commander Shaw. So stop wasting time with fool questions and get going! When Stingray surfaced in its pen, there was nothing out of the ordinary to be seen. Even when Troy had berthed the craft and he and Phones were lifted to the standby lounge, everything seemed normal. Do you think the old man was pulling some sort of practical joke, Troy? Puzzled Phones. But at that moment, the door of the lounge crashed open and the commander's motorized chair shot in. I thought you said we were under attack, Commander, said Troy, questioningly. What's going on? Commander Shaw swiveled to one of the big windows overlooking the approach to the command center. He pointed with quivering finger to a knot of men standing around a couple of parked demolition vehicles. We are under attack, Tempest, and there's the enemy. With that, the commander launched into an account of the visitors he'd had and what they intended to do. Father's really up in the air about all this, Troy. Atlanta Shaw had left the main control room and was standing by the commander's side. I've never seen him so riled. Wouldn't you be riled if they wanted to pull down your command center just to unearth a heap of bones? Why here? Why couldn't they have found their site under a store shed anywhere but beneath this building? You can't stop them, Commander, Troy spoke evenly. Not if they've got government permission. And you did say they'd offered to rebuild the control tower in double-quick time. We wouldn't be in temporary quarters longer than... I won't have it! The commander was shaking with rage again. I'll move heaven and earth to stop them, and what's more, you're going to back me up. Why, to hear you talk, I think you were in league with them! 
Okay, Commander, sighed Troy. Just tell us what you want, and we'll see how far it gets us. I guess you're right in principle. That's better, said Shaw, more calmly. Now this is what I have in mind for a start. You hand me a fake report from your patrol today. You make out Titan's aquafibians are on the rampage somewhere or other. So we've got an urgent operation on our hands. That way, they'll have to wait before they start. Father wants time to travel up to government headquarters and fight this thing at the source, broke in Atlanta. He thinks maybe he can persuade them to give up their idea. Persuade? I'm going to tell them, roared Commander Shaw. But Troy was already busy faking up an official report form. The ruse worked, insofar as it gave Commander Shaw the time he wanted. But that time was wasted. Shaw returned from government headquarters in a greater frenzy than ever, and practically incoherent with fury. We've had to drop the Titan spoof, Commander, Troy told him when Stingray's crew had been summoned to the main control room. That archaeologist guy and his pal with the briefcase began to get suspicious. I know, I know, raved Commander Shaw. And already these two maniacs are poking about in a shaft they've sunk below this building. Troy, I want them stopped. You've got to do something. But what, Commander? Muttering to himself, his brows drawing together in a tight frown, Shaw steered his motorized chair aimlessly about the room. Then suddenly, his face cleared, and he snapped his fingers with decision. I've got it. We've got to make them believe that their digging will do them no good. Troy, phones, you're about to become a pair of ghosts. For a moment, there was a stunned silence. Troy and Phones could only gape helplessly at their chief. Come again, Commander? Ghosts! You two are going to be the spooks that belong to the bones those guys intend to dig up. Get it? We scare them off. Oh no, Troy, groaned Phones softly. But there was no arguing with the commander. He'd seen his straw, and like a drowning man, had clutched at it. The main ventilator shaft from Stingray's pen. The shaft leads directly past the excavation those imbeciles have made. Get down there and make with the low, booming voices. You know, dare to disturb our rest and take the consequences, that sort of thing. Okay, Commander. Anything for a quiet life, muttered Troy, as he and Phones left the room to head for the elevators. Where's it gonna end, Troy? said Phones, on the way down to Stingray's pen. He's gone clean over the hill. He'll have us dancing around in white sheets before he's through. We've got to humor him, Phones. Whatever he says goes. But I sure agree with you. I can't see what the outcome's going to be. If the diggers want to dig, all the commander shores in the world won't stop them. Down in the smooth tunnel of the main ventilator shaft, Troy and Phones got to work with a screwdriver and carefully removed one of the sectioned alumino alloy side plates. Now they were looking at bare clay. By my calculations, we should be right alongside their excavation phones, said Troy. Come on, let's get this thing over with. Red in the face with embarrassment, phones cupped his hands and boomed towards the seven or eight inches of clay separating them from the diggers. Beware! Beware! A pause. Shucks, Troy. I can't keep this up. How about you having a go? Leave us in peace. In peace, I say. And so it went on, until, hardly bearing to look at each other, the men from Stingray crawled back to the pen and made their way up to the main control room to report. 
They hardly had time to report mission accomplished to Commander Shaw before there came a knock at the door. Atlanta opened it to admit Professor Molway and the man with the briefcase. What do you two want? barked Commander Shaw, visibly irritated by the smug looks on the faces of the newcomers. In prim tones, the government representative spoke first. <coughs> a most interesting point came up a few minutes ago, Commander. We were digging when all at once we heard voices. The amazing thing was that when we switched on our H-ray penetration telescanner, show them Professor Mulway, a most interesting picture appeared on the screen. The professor took up the story in self-satisfied tones. My machine actually looks through clay, soft rock and so forth, Commander. So we were able to observe two rather shamed-faced members of your staff playing, um, a little trick, perhaps? The door closed softly behind the two men, just in time to blanket the scarlet rage that burst yet again from Commander Shaw. Launch Stingray! he yelled at Troy. Get out there and take up action stations facing this headquarters. I'm going to tell those characters that I'll blow them off the face of the earth if they try to take so much as one brick out of my command center. But Commander, pleaded Troy, you can't be serious. You'll be dismissed. You can't take the law into your own hands like this. Do as I say, Troy. I'm taking full responsibility for this. The government's going to find out that I'm serious about my rights. You're not really going to obey those orders, Troy, said Phones nervously, as Stingray poised ready on the surface. Don't ask me, Phones, said Troy. When it comes to the pinch... The commander must back down. He must do. But Troy's voice was strangely strained. They could see it all happening from where they were. The small figures of Professor Molway and his colleague running towards the command centre to hear Commander Shaw's fantastic ultimatum. The seconds ticked by. Then at last came the crackle of static, heralding a radio message from control. This is it, phones, said Troy and drew a deep, nervous breath. But it was Atlanta's voice that came over the air. Hurry, Troy. Phones, get up here at once. It seems there's been a big mistake. When they reached the main control room, Troy and Phones found a changed man in Commander Shaw. Beaming all over his face, their chief was speaking to Professor Mulway and his friend with friendly enthusiasm. He even looked as though he had learned to like the precise little man with the briefcase and spectacles. Their plans were wrong, Troy, he roared. The site they want to explore isn't beneath the command center after all. Quite so, minced the man from the government. In fact, the site isn't beneath any of Marineville's strategic buildings. Although, put in Professor Molway, it is within Marineville. Commander Shaw chuckled. <laughs> I've given him the go-ahead, Troy. Remember what I said? My very own words? If their site had been beneath a storehouse, a garage... Well, that's great, Commander, smiled Troy. So where, in fact, is the new site? We were coming to that, only we haven't been able to get a word in Edgeways said the man from the government. We are already demolishing the, um, dwelling apartment situated at the intersection of Route 6 and 4, a hundred yards from this very building. But that's my house! Boone's Commander Shaw. Uh, yes, I was leading up to that, sir. I uh, wanted to break the news to you gently. Of course, the government will build you a brand new home, uh, bigger than your present one, if you like. Commander Shaw was livid. His blood pressure built up at the thought of his own home being torn down. You can't! I won't let you! He spluttered. 
I'll keep that house if it's the last thing I do. Do you hear me? Do you hear? Do you hear? Do you hear? Commander Shaw shot bolt upright in bed and wiped the sweat from his brow. It had all been a horrible nightmare. It's time to get up, Father. Atlanta's smiling face appeared in the doorway. We're having T-bone steaks for breakfast this morning. They'll be ready in ten minutes. The commander turned to his daughter in horror. If I hear the word bone again, I'll... Strange enchantments that start whenever you're near Marina, Aqua Marina Why can't you whisper the words that my heart is longing to hear? Your magic to me a beautiful mystery I'm certain to fall, I know Because you enthrall me so Marina Aqua Marina Why don't you say That you'll always stay Close to my heart Nice. We didn't say anything can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't good lie, work. You see, no, that was they, great. Those two are fantastic readers. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely set. Very atmospheric and very retro feeling, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And a sort of intimacy you get with a single reader. I hope you agree from hearing that little preview. So there you go. Yeah, lovely. Um, anything can happen will be out uh, next month uh, on CD or download from bigfinish.com. And. Um, yeah, there'll be more to come, but do let us know what you thought. Email us, podcast, com, or uh, uh, whatever you like. Go, go on. You're going to say something did you, really, really did you just smart. Say, did you just say there'll be more to come? Did I say that? I don't think I I'm said sure. that. sure. You just said there'll be more to come. I may yeah. have said that, huh? but there we go. Huh? Anyway, if you'd like to pre-order hmm. it from the Jerry okay. Anderson store, you can go to anderdotson slash annual, A-N-D-R dot S-N slash annual, and uh, you will find it there to pre-order. Lovely. And now over on YouTube, where we post all sorts of exciting things, such as free episodes from your favourite series, uh, Chris Dale's amazing primers for series you might not have seen before, uh, and all sorts of videos about uh, actors from the Jerry Anderson shows, etc. And, fab facts, people have been commenting beneath our last uh, couple, particularly the one featuring Ed Bishop and his inspiration for playing Straker, which seems to have touched quite a nerve amongst our listeners. Zippa Litra posted, uh, Straker is a spectacular character, and if it had been any other actor, the character would have been a massive misstep. Straker treads the line between hero and anti-hero perfectly, and does what needs to be done at any given moment, a perfectly flawed main character decades before we retreated to the early 2000s and 2010 TV anti-heroes of Tony Soprano and Walter White. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting. Uh, John Nowak says Straker is one of the very few science fiction commanders who comes across as someone who would be entrusted with a multi-billion dollar project. The Batman posted, even as a kid, I knew Ed Straker was a very dark man, yet also a very good man too. Ed Bishop was amazing. And Kate Jamieson says, another interesting point is that other characters did play against type at times. They would act cool and in control, but in other episodes, they would act in an opposite way. Ed Bishop played Straker the same way every show. Ebbed when he was in the company of operatives, he maintained just enough of a professional distance. Outstanding. So yeah, lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, applaudits for uh, Ed Bishop. Tom Don M finally says Ed Bishop was a top-notch actor. A shame there was only one season of UFO. Uh, for your information, he says they really didn't press red buttons. By the 1960s, U.S. Air Force officers had the guns to compel the other officer to turn their launch key if they hesitated. 
they routinely conducted drills and would never have known if launch codes uh, that they revealed were real or a drill code. Fortunately to date, no launch codes have been real. So that's from Don M. Really trying wow. to dig deep into uh, the whole process of, uh, of uh, instigating a nuclear war there and uh, yeah. how it managed to inspire Ed Bishop into playing Straker. Yeah. Well, it's great. I get the, gra- the, the gravity of his role and the, yes. of the job that Ed Straker had. So it's perfectly yep. fitting. And uh, yeah. yeah, we'll keep trying to find out exactly what that documentary was. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, do comment away beneath our YouTube videos and I shall read some more out next week. Marvellous. Now, Chris Dale has down tools. Yes, He's he got has. chalk. Yes, he has. Uh, Look. They've got a full range, including yep. uh, canine Lady Penelope. I and, uh, like that. Is that an English bulldog? Parker, I think it As is. As Parker, yeah, that sort works. Sort of makes sense, doesn't it? It really but, does. Uh, That's good. The other, the Tracy brothers are a bit generic dog-wise, Chris. Oh, sorry. Oh. He looks a bit offended Ooh. by that. But... Everyone's a critic. Crikey. Well, all right. Sorry. Anyway, mm. uh, so maybe Thunderbird, Thunder Dogs, sorry, will be go. Yes. Uh, but uh, Chris, I think you've got a job to do. So stop your sketching and your drawing. It's time to press the big red button on your randomizer. There is a there is a red button on that. It's not a launch key. Is. No. no guns involved. It's just Chris. No. I mean, yep. Marina's are around too, but it's mostly Chris. Sure. Uh, so Chris, it's time to pick your random episode of a random Jerry Anderson show and say some great things about it. Over to you. <laughs> When I was a boy, I first saw Thunderbirds, Stingray and Joe 90, many more. Now I like to watch in random order, what will be this week? Let's find out. Ooh la la la, it's the randomizer. Ooh la la la, filled with all that stuff. Ooh la la la, press the big red button. Ooh la la la, pick a random show. Most of what we see is quite exciting Some of it is torchy, never mind Talk a bit about it, make some comments Hope that people like it, ooh, what's this? Ooh la la la, here's the printout now Ooh la la la, let us take a look Ooh la la la, and we've got some stingray Ooh la la la, and it's sea of oil So, from an early episode of Captain Scarlet, we go to an early episode of Stingray with Sea of Oil, and I'm trying to remember when I first saw this. I'm pretty sure I didn't see it the first time the BBC broadcast the show. Possibly I saw it as part of a series of uh, summer repeats that the show had on BBC Two during the school holidays. Uh, but I'm not sure. I definitely saw it. Keep it going. Keep it going! When Channel 5 had a Jerry Anderson Day, the uh, Mr. Thunderbird documentary they showed, but uh, in the lead up to that, uh, which was shown at 8 o'clock, they showed several Anderson episodes throughout the day, and this was chosen as the representative episode of Stingray. Um, I'm I'm not convinced that was the best choice. Goes. It's not a standout landmark episode of the show, it's totally decent, but um, it, was, it was shown um, between... Space 1999, um, which of course, you know, if you're going to pick a, a great classic episode of Space 1999, you've got to pick the Tabor, haven't you? And uh, after this, they showed uh, Joe 90, Most Special Agent. We've started! It was strange, actually, having grown up with the Anderson shows on the BBC to suddenly see them on, on Channel 5, of all places. But yes, this was... Uh, so, so I recorded those, uh, those broadcasts and... Um, Come to think of it, I think I probably still have the second half of the the Sea of Oil broadcast that I taped um, backed up to digital somewhere. My goodness. Anyway, I have waffled over, as is my way. Stop the drilling! These guys, well, this guy and some off-screen voices have, uh, they're on a drilling rig. They're starting drilling. Hey, Jack! But the drill's going a bit wobbly. Sure can! Let's get out of here! And they, they, yeah, they're not going to stick around for the, it's getting very wobbly. Ooh. Cut the dinghy free! Ooh, Chris. This uh, breakup of the rig on the puppet set. Station four. Some of it looks quite nice, and other times you can sort of sense off screen wires kind of pulling, that the ladder just sort of jumps off the deck with a bit of a. There's a launch on the way! A, a flourish. Out of here, Chris! Yeah, be right with you. I want to collect the charts. It's interesting comparing this 
oil rig destruction to uh, a, a later similar sequence in Fire at Rig 15. Anyway, the rig is just falling to bits, but luckily uh, Preston and his off-screen chums have got a launch from which they can escape. Yes, of course, we're coming up on the destruction of the rig, which was mined for clips in the opening titles. So it is quite an iconic shot of the rig. Uh, well, this one, does it tip over or does it explode? Yeah, this one just collapses, yeah. So that shot is briefly seen in the opening titles. It's not quite as spectacular as a shot of what I guess is the same model where the entire tower just leaps into the air. But it's still a very nice special effect. And uh, we get this shot of um, some plans in the water. Zoom in on those, it all goes a bit fady. And when we come to Marineville, we resume with a shot of those same plans. And the camera refocuses. It's an interesting transition, but the shot of Marineville in between kind of spoils it. Just a noise, and then the drilling rig falls to pieces. It's not my fault. You can say that again. The first and second time, okay. This is a coincidence. A third time, <laughs> no, sir. Yeah. Well, uh, have you considered gross incompetence on the part of you and your men? Well, thanks, Commander. Sure can use it. We can afford another failure. This is pretty important, eh? Important? With the oil fields becoming exhausted every day? This is top priority. Well, okay, calm down, calm down. You don't come into Marineville and tell us what to do, buddy. But I do like episodes like this, and again, Fire at Rig 15, where they mention the fact that all these incredible vehicles... They need fuel to operate them. It's not just plug a nuclear reactor into them and, and that's the end of it. Tower of Atlanta. Tower from Stingray. PW OR. But yes, third episode in production order, Sea of Oil. Your old man agreed to your coming on this trip. And Atlanta's along for the ride. Is anyone that you'll need a surface base? Besides, why should Marina have all the fun? Oh, Marina looks thoroughly cheesed off. Uh, yeah, well, it's nice to have you along. I guess. Uh, uh. H6. 600 knots. Oh, Marina's actually got her sad blinking face on. She doesn't want Atlanta here. Oh, well. Oh. Oh, yes, there's that. That's a nice shot. I've always liked of Commander Shaw, but on Blu-ray now you can see, again, there's a human hand assisting his arm to yawn. We're right on schedule. I suspect that's always been there, but I'm really noticing real human hands a lot in Blu-rays now. I don't mind it. Because I would rather leave it in there than have someone come along and say, "Oh, well, we've got to, we've got to fix that." Um, I, I like seeing those little, uh, those little, you know, examples of how the puppets had to be assisted at times. Anyway, it establishes that uh, Stingray has been uh, on the way now for quite some time. To drilling rig number four, I guess. Take her into the rig, phones. Well, right in, Troy. Okay. Hmm. And I like as well that this model has a fairly de fairly detailed uh, deck. Doesn't quite match up what we see on the puppet stage. Oh, and Atlanta and Marina are sat in the back of Stingray just chatting. Well, Atlanta's chatting. What a beaut. Good to see you, Troy. Bang on schedule. And Miss Shore, this is a pleasant surprise. Ooh. You're a lucky guy, Troy Tempest. Yeah, I know. So that's our little crew, huh? Well, uh, Mac Quiet. Meet Marina. Wow. God, this guy. It is a real pleasure. He seemed quite professional earlier, and uh, now he's like, oh, women, wow. Marina comes from the sea, Prez. I suppose he's been at sea for a long time. Island woman, huh? <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> well, shall we get Oh, dear, yes. Um, well, I think he's uh, cemented himself there as um, a product of his time, let's say. Uh, the first to make the oh silent woman, eh? Woo, woo, woo. But unfortunately, I don't think he was the last. Anywho, let's do some more drilling. Keep it going. Stingray from base, you are clear to dive. Base from Stingray, understood. Here we go. Oh, I notice on the um the bunks on the back of the uh, office behind Atlanta there. There's some. Uh, some girly pictures on the wall. Uh, I don't think there's uh, anything too revealing, but that's interesting. I'd, uh, 
I'll maybe go back and have another look at that later and see if uh, there's anything identifiable there. Anyway, Stingray is now following the drill down to the, uh, the ocean floor. All readings normal. Let's hope it stays that way. All right, this is where the fun usually starts. Could we be about to destroy oil rig number four? It's all threatening to get a bit exciting. But I don't think it actually will. Oh, no, but wait. Here's a uh, suspicious craft approaching. An alien submarine. And I really like... Uh, getting a signal. And it wasn't... It, was, it didn't often happen with this show. It happened a lot in XL5. Where you have uh, alien vessels that are clearly repurposed aircraft model kits. That is clearly some kind of plane. But I really like the idea of, of that as a... Maybe subplane or a space plane in XL5 it, it particularly it looked really good I don't think I would like it so much in Stingray but as a one-off this this sub is quite fun stars we're making good progress Stingray's about to surface now after a routine patrol no incidents to report right keep in touch well the rig foreman's been hitting on me constantly but aside from that nothing to report well no action so far there was that signal yeah, that signal. I'm talking like I heard a ghost. But that's quite ominous. And also, oh, there's the, the sub again. We only saw the uh, the hands, the alien hands of the uh, person at the controls. Same routine tomorrow? Yeah, okay with me. How about you, Troy? Sure. Hey, look, we've got a visitor. Oh, no. Oink. Oh, I'd forgotten about him. Oh, this is his introduction, isn't it? <laughs> Guess oink, he's sunbathing. Oink. <laughs> it's Oink. Oh, dear. Uh, oh, God. I don't think it's his first appearance on the randomizer, but... Um, yeah, this is probably a good time to talk about Oink. I don't like him. And I think it is... Firstly, the fact we this show doesn't need an animal... around to cause problems and, and be silly... I think it works in Supercar to an extent XL5, but here it doesn't work. And I think it's it was quite a good idea. I'm glad that they realised that he didn't work and he disappears quite quickly. Of course, unfortunately, with the original Stingray broadcast order in the UK, this was shown near the end of the run, after several episodes where it had already been hanging around for a while. But, hey-ho, that's not the fault of the people who made the show. I also question the fact that uh, nobody raises the idea that Oink might be responsible for all these uh, rig destructions. Say, uh, what happened to Marina? Oh, she says she was going to sit on the deck a while. Yeah, I guess she enjoys looking at the sea. Yeah, yeah, okay, phones. Let's get some sleep. I'm hmm. beat. This is a, a lovely image of Marina sat on the deck as well. Say, Troy, you know what? Good night. I also like that... Um, Troy and Phones have each got the same ashtray on the side of their, their bunk. Uh, yeah, it's just a nice image of, um, of Marina on the deck. This image, though, of um, wet footprints on... Well, it's a sort of wooden floor deck of Stingray. I think that's meant to be the interior. It certainly can't be the, the, the exterior. But to be honest, I've never really understood how Stingray's interior works. I think it's one of those things like with Skydiver where there's there's got to be more interior than the model really has room for. Anyway, our alien visitor has snuck aboard Stingray. Marina's heard a splash, so she figures, what the heck? Let's swim after it and see what we can see. Because our alien visitor has very quickly, it would appear, snatched Atlanta. Managed to get her out to the plane. I'm not sure in that case what the splash was. Unless he dragged Atlanta under the water and then stuffed her into the stuffed her into his ship. But his ship is now entering an underwater airlock. I like as well the they hold off revealing the look of the aliens. We just saw Atlanta bound and gagged there, and we just saw a hand working controls next to her. And to conclude this report, Stingray met no interference whatsoever on the first day of the mission. <sighs> Guess I'd better turn in. 
I hope they're all sleeping peacefully. Leave anyone on duty? No, no, just abandon the control tower. This is a very early episodes. So they seem to forget Lieutenant Fisher was a character who could uh, take over. Whoever it is, tell him I'm in conference. Yeah, it doesn't sound urgent. As a guess, I'd say we've had all the sleep we're going to get. I love the frantic uh, gestures Marina's making here. And here we are in the underwater alien, uh, well, I hesitate to say city. It, um... Welcome back, Gary. What news of the invaders? I... It looks very nice, very colourful. Nevir, she will tell us of their plans if she knows what is good for her. Oh, yes, that's it. Atlanta has been kidnapped by the naughty aliens, who, I should uh, point out, have uh, also snuck a, a bomb onto the side of Stingray. This way, Troy. Uh, what's going on? You mean to say she went over the side? Ooh. She fell in. No? Then did someone take her? Is it that seal? Come I'm going to have that seal. Marina, you lead the way. Don't you understand? We're not invaders. We just want oil. We would have let you take all the oil had you just asked. We are peace-loving people. You mm. would have nothing to fear. We have. That's why we planted a bomb on your ship. I do like the idea, though, that uh, one moment we have a, a genuinely friendly, helpful alien race who would have given the humans everything they wanted had they just asked, as they said. It's lost for them. I planted a bomb on their sea ship. It's nice that they did this very early in production order. We have two episodes of Titan, evil underwater alien stuff, and then, oh no, wait, they're not all like this under the sea. Uh, just most of them. Uh, yes, we've covered uh, one of my favourite episodes, The Lighthouse Dwellers, previously on the Randomizer, which again has uh, friendly aliens who uh, take against the Stingray crew following a misunderstanding. That's it. Stingray's pulling away from the rig. Stations. I like how the, the, the lighting on the Stingray set has been reduced to look like it's taking place at night. Fight a dive. Flood Q. Flood Q. Oh, as soon as they go down, that bomb's going to go kablooey. Stop the dive. Blow Q. What's wrong? Service video scan has failed. We'll have to check it out. Oh, no. Oh, shucks. What could be blocking the uh, surface video scan? Oink, oink. Oh, it's that little pest again. He must have been in front of the oink, SVS lens. Oink, oink. <laughs> Holding up a bomb. It's a sticker bomb. Prepare for crash dive. This ocean scan. Hmm. So, Oink uh, is saving the day. Uh, I still say, you know, I feel like uh, Atlanta in the second episode, you know, maybe, maybe he's just a spy sent here to destroy us. Possible. Our radios work on an entirely different principle to yours. Well, well, different principle to radio. Okay. I could only assume that they meant to destroy us. I like the look of this, these, these aliens, particularly the leader, with with the beard. These sort of just dangling um, strands of, of thread for a beard. Anyway, the bomb's gone, but Stingray's all right. Yeah. But that little seal that warned us wouldn't have stood a chance. Hooray! Well, thank goodness. He could have become a regular... Oink, oh, God, he's oink, still here. Oink, oink, oink. How did he get in here? I don't know, but I'm sure glad he did. Said no one ever, because he's a very creepy-looking puppet. Yeah, the puppet is uh, unfortunate. I... I'm just so glad that they didn't go down the, the comedy am animal route with this show. I'm truly sorry. They trial it for a few episodes, it doesn't work, and then we forget about it. There is a strange And that's for the best, really. Oh, it must be Stingray. No, it is a seal. A brave, heroic seal. Which way, Marina? They are coming directly towards us. Their equipment must be able to follow our trail. <laughs> it's just Marina's got a very good sense of direction. What will he do? Well, I guess he'll open it with explosives. <gasps> then our city is doomed. The mighty oceans will flood in. And all two of us will die. I know I go on about that with Stingray underwater civilizations, but it would be nice if, if you got some sense that there was more to this city than just one room. We use your ship, but Stingray's missiles will destroy our small craft. Oh, we've got no choice. If you'll take the chance, I'll come with you. But if we stay here, we'll all die. Lovely lighting in this scene as well, from the, the reflection of the control panel on Atlanta's face. But I also like so much of Lois Maxwell's performance in this episode. That's it. They're deploying their little seaplane. I love this thing. Open the airlock. 
Atlanta and uh, Alien Number Two going out to try and uh, stop Stingray from blowing them up. I'm getting that signal again. Guess we'll give them something to think about. Prepare to launch Sting missiles. We'll let them think about it for a split second before they explode. That'll teach them. We're closing the gap fast. It's a wonder humanity wasn't at war with uh, underwater aliens long before this. Green 2-9. 2,000 yards. I'm getting them loud and clear. Sting missiles on standby. Horizontal hydroplanes, four degrees, right, right. But I do love, again, as I said, with uh, not only having friendly aliens, but also it's not just one race of aliens that that we've got a whole... We've we've now got a whole world of uh, underwater creatures and communities that have been here potentially as long as as humanity. I, I just find that a fascinating idea. If they fire their missiles, we just won't stand a chance. We'll be blown to pieces. 750? 700? Oh, so what are they going to do? Well, again, thank goodness they brought Atlanta along. If only we could make them understand we're not a hostile craft. I've got it! Of course. Phones will be listening into the noise of our motors. Can I control the power of our motors? Yes, here. Well, here's hoping. Hey, a bit of the old Morse code. 350? 300? I would have to guess there's normally at least one episode per Anderson series where Morse code seems to save the day. 50? And again, it's it's a nice resolution. You expect Stingray to go to battle with this craft. Hold the missiles by remote control. And we don't have to do that, but we do get an explosion. You know, for, for those of us who are looking forward to an explosion, we get one anyway. Of the approaching craft, they were spelling out Atlanta. Atlanta? Yeah, in the international distress code. Then what are we waiting for? La 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 It's happy We've made a new friend Well, I guess we've worked out all our little problems now How can we ever thank you for treating us so well When we almost robbed you of your wives Wives? What do you know about me and phones? The word, is it not? Or is it lives? Oh. Well, that's better. I guess... Well, if aliens have got such a great command of English, it's surprising they would um, confuse those two words. Your lasting friendship. Yay, free oil for everybody. And the guy on the rig is very happy. Because he gets a, a spurt full in the face. I've always felt, though, with that ending, there, there should be a moment. It would be a very uh, Stingray moment for him to then go back to his cabin and, um, in celebration, light up a big cigar, blow the rig to bits, and then it cuts back to him in the debris, and he's, he's all smouldering and whatever, and he says, Well, if that don't beat all. I've always felt that ending should be there. It's, it's probably just me, but uh, hey ho, that was Sea of Oil, uh, a very early episode of Stingray, um, which introduces the idea that not all underwater creatures are a threat, which is a very welcome one. Um, some nice effects work with the rig. Um, it also, unfortunately, introduces uh, an element of the series that thankfully will not stick around very long, namely Little Oink. <laughs> I don't know if Oink has too many fans, uh, to be honest. Uh, I, if you are an Oink fan, please, uh, please, you know, give him some love on 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 the Facebook group, perhaps, or uh, or maybe just keep it to yourself. But anyway, I rather enjoyed that one. Uh, I've always rather enjoyed that one, to be honest. It's it's not great, but there's nothing wrong with it as such. It's just you know a, a, a typical average episode of Stingray. Some enjoyable effects work, some nice character moments, uh, particularly. Getting Atlanta out of the control tower for the first time and uh, letting her go on a bit of an adventure. Good stuff. Ah, the saccharine sounds of Aquamarina there at the end. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, hello. Twiggy, Twiggy does not approve, as it turns no, out. No, obviously not. No, yeah. oh well. Yeah, so, yeah she never liked Marina. She didn't like Oink in particular. So. Um, oh, that'll be it. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. So. Anyway, uh, Chris will be back next time with maybe not Stingray, but it is random, so it could be Stingray, but it won't be Stingray Sea of Oil. It'll be something else. 
True. Who knows what? Yes. It's random. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows what? So it will never be the same one twice. Because when I put my iPod on shuffle, for example, it's never as random as you think. And sometimes it does play the same song twice. Yeah. But isn't there's a thing about that, isn't there? Didn't we mention it on a previous podcast ah, about Spotify and randomness or something? Right, right. It, it right. wasn't worth remembering. No, no let's no. just not let's not no, investigate this. Just further. not bother. No, fine. Yeah. I'm sorry, I brought it up. Uh, anyway, do get in touch with us, Jerry Anderson uh, podcast uh, uh, co- at Jerry. No, hang on. No, no, let me start again. <laughs> let me start. Oh, no, I'm very hot. I'm very Ooh, hot. We, yeah, I'm losing. Right. I'm losing air in my little booth. Right. Get in touch podcast at jerryanderson.com because I want to hear your anderongs. Put it in the yes. subject line. A-N-D-E-R no, A-N-D-E-W-R O-N-G-S. <laughs> Tell me what really annoys you that people get wrong about Jerry Anderson. Stop getting Jerry Anderson wrong. Let me know. Please do. And I shall read them out next time. While that was happening, I was being attacked by a daddy long legs. So I that noticed, was, uh, yes. It was very big Hilarious. one as well. Goodness me. Mm. Landed on my thigh inappropriately. Mm. I should be having words with him afterwards. Uh, you were anyway. rather like uh, John Pertwee in The Green Death trying to evade that huge wasp in the quarry in Wales. Yeah, it was almost as big as that. Almost. But we are in Wales, so it's quite authentic. Anywho, mm. right. I think yeah. that's the end of this one, isn't it? Are we done? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm boiling. Let me go. Okay, fine. Um, everyone should go and cool off now. We've had a lovely time spending uh, an hour or so with you. Thanks for listening, Costerons. Yeah. We'll be back next time, but make sure you email, email us, podcast at jerryanderson.com, leave us a rating and all that stuff. Mm. See you in pod 216. Crikey. See you then. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. Okay, so obviously we've got um, Thunder Dogs. Yes. Very quickly. Space mm. Precinct cast. Right, as? Dogs, still. Oh, okay. Obs. It's oh, sure. the okay. dogs thing. Oh, I like it, yeah. Um, so uh, we'll just go with the, with the human characters. So right. Brogan, Haldane, yeah. and, uh, and, and Castle. Okay, what, what I see, breeds? Well, I see, I see Brogan as a, as a bloodhound. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, Do yeah, you think? yeah, 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 that's great. Okay. Uh, uh, I think Haldane would be a young sort of uh, puppy, wouldn't it? Annoying little yappy a sort of puppy. Sp- Springer Spaniel. Yeah, 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 that sort of bites your ankles and gets in the way. Yeah. Uh, Castle. Simone. Well, uh, I mean, are there any Danish breeds of dog that we could... Uh, there must be a uh, Danish probably, setter or a... Probably, I don't know. A Danish yeah. setter, it sounds fine. I'm, I feel like you made that up, but okay. Well, let's go with that. Okay. There you go. Brilliant. Well, I, I'm glad we've uh, sorted that out. Uh, oh, and we, of course, Sally Brogan, with her lovely red hair, would be a red setter. So of that course. Work. Yes. Oh, I, I want to watch it now. And the two kids would be, uh, you know, a couple of little ducks and pups. Yeah. Well, I've got several of those, so they're, they're already cast. <laughs> there you go. So we just, have to work out, right here. we just have to work out a name. That's the th- problem, isn't it? Well, instead of Space Precinct, something that yeah. incorporates dogs. <sighs> right. Mm. Space. Kennel. Dog. Yeah, that's that's hard, isn't it? Space dogs, was as far as I got then. S- space space dogs, <laughs> space police dogs. Anyway, oh, we'll, yeah, yeah. Possibly. We're sort of going off the thing now. But if you've got a great yeah. idea and you're still listening, Podstron, I'm saying definitely singular now because there'll only be one of you. Podcast at jerryanson dot com with a with a canine dot related com. title. Yeah. yeah, right. I think it's time to go sorry. now. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but bye. <laughs> I told you not to lick me. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.